Fantastic. So we're recording now. Um, good evening. We'll kick off. Um, people tend to, to join over the, the, the next few minutes, but I think you know, we're trying to do quite a bit in this, this hour, so um, let's, let's make the most of the time. So um, welcome to number six of the Quantum London Stamtish event. For, for those of you who don't have a good European education, Stamtisch um, is, is the German idea of getting together for a pint of beer and a chat or more than one pint of beer or a litre of beer or whatever it might be on a regular basis. That was our aspirations, um, Em and myself, back last summer. It started quite well. We had some good discussions. And then, of course, um, this dastardly pandemic got in the way. So we're doing the, the next best thing, which is having a conversation here. And for those who haven't joined before, this is very different to our normal webinars. The webinars are focused on, on an expert talking and then dealing with our Q&A. This is much more of a, a sort of a chat and a round table. The, um, the structure for tonight will be going around, doing some sort of brief introductions and updates from people, keen just to know, you know why you've joined, what your background is, do you bring specific knowledge or just interest? And then if there's any particular topic that's caught your attention over the last few weeks, be it um, you know, an announcement from a new company that uh, is discussing um, their use of, of quantum technology or whatever it might be. So we'll go around and do that. Um, you know, please do feel free to, to ask questions of people, but bearing in mind the complexities of a, a Zoom session, don't sort of over talk each other too much, please. Um, then Anna will lead us through some questions coming out of the um, the excellent webinar we had last week with um, Andy Stanford Clark of IBM. It's triggered some interesting questions. It'd be great to, to discuss those. Um, and then for the last 15 or so minutes, um, I'll hand over to Jeremy, who's got two um, very different topics, but both uh, joined by the, the word quantum. So he can talk us um, through some of what he's doing. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll go around. I'll, I'm going to start with, with M simply because um, he's got to, to drop off in a moment and deliver some very complex assignment in the insurance innovation space by seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, so M, starting with you, do you want to quickly say a, a hi and give an update? Yes. Hi, everyone. Nice to see many of you here today. And um, I work in insurance as per Paolo's just comments just a second ago, working in innovation. Uh, I've been curious about quantum computing for, for a while. I cannot define myself as an expert, but you know, I was having more and more conversation and you know, I'm trying to build up my knowledge a bit. And the reason why I got involved with Quantum London was exactly you know, to build my knowledge and um, also uh, be, you know, build um, a network as well of people interested. Uh, I can pick their brains and uh, help me understand a bit more. And um, yep, yeah. I will leave you to back to you, Paolo. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna, gonna wander around the screen and hopefully get to everyone. If at the end I haven't got to you, please do shout out. So, so Peter Neil, do you wanna do a quick hi and what's on your mind? Uh, yep, sure. Um, so I'm Peter, um, I've been a software engineer in um, a few industries for about 20 years, mostly in Java. Um, I had an interest in quantum computing um, as an undergraduate um, and really um, was frustrated at that time with the fact that there wasn't an easy, accessible way into doing anything with it. Um, and I'm getting very interested again now that there are accessible ways into it. Um, so at the moment, I'm still kind of dipping my toes back in the water. Um, but yeah, uh, bringing some curiosity. Fantastic. Welcome, Peter. Gregor. I first have to find the unmute button. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm Gregor. Um, I, I am a mathematician. I did startups for a while. And now I'm quite heavy into modeling for a few insurers. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm interested in quantum. We explored it as a potential startup, but <laughs> we figured out that we're not knowledgeable enough. So hopefully also thanks to this group, uh, we're going to build some knowledge and experiences in the next few years so yeah not not an expert but hope to learn learn more absolutely thanks gregor welcome daniel yeah, hello actually i'm not from london but from stockholm hope you will still keep me here oh absolutely <laughs> there are in fact not uh, too much uh, quantum things going on in stockholm uh, we have in the university researcher 
I visited him and he is doing ion traps. And so that's kind of fun. But in terms of startups, we don't have anything. Uh, I have a LinkedIn recruiter account. So I can search for people by scale and there is not much to find in Stockholm. Uh, me, myself, uh, I- Daniel, yeah, what, what brings you to the topic? Uh, I like to tinker with quantum computing. I have a background in uh, engineering physics in terms of education, but I work in software. Uh, so I'm playing around trying to build things, which is hard. Uh, so I want to see what's going on as, elsewhere in the world. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Hopefully we can show you some of what's on people's minds. Um, Chuck, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'm Chuck Schreiber. Um, I've been working in <coughs> IT and software since the late 80s, um, basically software testing. And that's my area of expertise. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I got into quantum um, just because it sounded very interesting and use a lot of math, which is something I enjoyed in college. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Chuck. Um, Sasha. Hi, my name is Sasha Tabak. I am a CEO, founder, and head of research of Quantum Leap, the quantum computing company from Tel Aviv, Israel, and US. Um, um, very like the area and uh, very like to network with same minded people. So this is, I'm here. Fantastic. Delighted to have you. So are you based in, in Tel Aviv or based in the US or where are you today? Uh, no, we based in Tel Aviv, but and in the US, our company in US. So we have the two departments, R&D in Israel and US based, but we are looking also to come to UK. So, Fantastic. Um, excellent. Well, welcome, Sasha Perlind. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm on a device that doesn't have video for whatever reason. Um, I'm a co-founder of uh, Teridian. We've been working six years. My uh, co-founder is Scott. Uh, we've been, we're both, we're both old IBMers. Um, and we kind of fell over each other. Uh, when I was living in Bangkok about six years ago, he came with some very interesting uh, quantum thoughts. And right now we're working on quantum inspired machine learning uh, on our own platform. And we've just released a uh, forecasting mechanism on a, on a 24 hour basis of Bitcoin and, and FX, which is up and running as, as an AS, um, an, an API right now. Fantastic, exciting times. Um, welcome, um, David, David Pell. Oh, hi there. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the second meeting I've been with in the group. Um, the first one being uh, the last one, which was the IBM one. Um, so I'm a, a data engineer at Eurostar. Um, and then, so when coronavirus happened, I found myself in a position where, okay, job's uncertain. I was thinking about PhDs and um, I realized quantum seemed to be the route that things are taking at the moment, you know, you've not, you've not got much um, of a saturated market there. Um, and then I thought, you know, well, I'm going to learn how to do quantum computing, bought a book, and then realized it's very difficult. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the main reason I'm with you guys is because I want to get support in learning how to do quantum computing. Fantastic. Well, hopefully either directly or, or as in today or more likely indirectly through the network, we can, can help you do that. You're by no means the only one who's um, looking for that kind of inspiration. So welcome, David. Um, Balaji. Hey, hello, everyone. This is Balaji and uh, I'm based in USA and I work for a company called Kairos Technologies, which is a technological transformation company based out of US. 
And uh, we are trying to implement a research team on quantum computing, focusing on technical ends, not on the business aspects as of now. Yeah. Perfect, interesting, welcome. And uh, I manage the innovation of this technology in our form. Brilliant, excellent, welcome. Um, Elia, did you pronounce correctly, Elia? Uh, Ilya. Ilya, apologies. It's correct, yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Ilya from Novisat Serbia. Uh, I run my own startup for several years in the field of data science, data engineering. I mean, we are a web analytics tool uh, and also I'm a uh, member of management board of Data Science Serbia. It's a huge uh, community of uh, data science professionals, data science, data engineering professionals. And now this year we are starting a new chapter uh, that's related to the quantum technologies, specifically uh, to qu quantum machine learning. Uh, what I'm doing here, uh, first place is networking and uh, because the quantum community still is not too, too, too big at the world level. Uh, so we need to exchange the, the knowledge and uh, the insights uh, to motivate each other. So that's why I'm here. Perfect. Welcome. Mick. Hi, all. Yeah, I'm Mick Cooney. I'm uh, dialing in from um, Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm kind of, I've been around kind of the insurance and capital markets scene for insurance for about the last five and capital markets for about 10 years before that i've no real wisdom or, or anything like that to offer i'm just here really on a just because i'm curious about what's going on fantastic well look look forward to to your input mate we've obviously known each other a few years and um you you always have fantastic insight um so who do we have we have um iy bian Um, hello everyone. So uh, I'm based in London. I did my undergraduate in University of Sheffield in material physics and currently I'm doing my master degree in quantum technologies uh, in quantum technologies in University College London. Uh, I was thinking about doing um, doing my research project in applying quantum technologies in finance, but uh, my supervisor said there is a lot of hype around it. So currently, I'm doing my research project in um, low uh, in low dimension semiconductors. So yeah, basically that's it. And uh, I'm quite interested in quantum computing. I'm going to join a workshop uh, in quantum computing next week. I'm not sure if any of you heard about it. Anyway, I will send the link later. All right, that's it, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Jeremy, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself uh, when you do your piece at the end, if that's okay. Um, so just briefly about myself, then I, well, is there anyone who I haven't called? I think I've managed to get everyone. Perfect. So. Um, Briefly about myself, then I'll hand over to Anna. So my name is Paolo Cuomo. Um, I come to this topic um, as, a, as a complete amateur. To the earlier point, uh, Emma and I have been discussing this since last summer, but essentially I've always been trying to understand how new technologies impact the industries I'm working in. Um, and obviously quantum is, is here now. Um, my sense is that by engaging with a community like this, this is the best way to learn. So I look forward to, to learning from a lot of you, I tend to ask more questions and offer answers. I find that's the best way to, to understand from, from what you're all, um, the different views you have. So I'm delighted to be here and delighted to have all of you here. Um, what I will do once Anna takes over with some questions, I will drop a few points in the chat, um, some links and things, but also I'd be really keen. Um, one of the downsides of, of Zoom is you can effectively join without your, your proper name or your location or anything like that, where you're happy to, to share um, uh, where you physically are. We've obviously heard of some people in, in Dublin and Stockholm and places, but it's great to know quite how expansive um, this, this webinar is. Um, and if you, I think most of you have got your full name listed, but if you, if you haven't, if you could put that in the chat, if you're happy to, that would be great as well. Um, so without further ado, Anna, do you want to, to introduce yourself and then start to kick off those questions? Hi everyone, I'm Anna. Um, I'm also a complete amateur to this field. I work in the insurance industry. Um, I'm currently in analytics and modeling, but my interest in um, quantum computing 
started when I was in um, the innovation team at Lloyd's and working on a paper looking at the impacts of quantum computing on the insurance industry. So I'm really interested to look at the business applications um, of quantum computing and learn a little bit from all of you. Um, so to kick off this session, um, we had a great talk by um, Andy Santa Clark last week from IBM, where he demystified some of quantum computing for us. Um, must admit, I still don't completely understand it all, which um, I think if I did, probably haven't understood it at all. <laughs> that is the point. Um, but it inspired a few interesting questions, which I thought we could discuss today and get your ideas on. So without further ado, the first question um, that I'd like to discuss is, given that IBM now allow free access to a fleet of 29 of their co quantum computers via the cloud, how and when do you think that companies will be encouraged to start dabbling in quantum solutions? So if anyone's got any ideas about that. Well, I, I, I can I can take that. Uh, we're we're actually on a power server with IBM out of uh, actually it's in the U.S. somewhere. I think it's Arizona. Uh, but because of our close links to IBM, we've been working very closely with them. And uh, our our view has always been in the six years that we've been working to, together, Scott and I has been we need to solve meaningful problems uh, that are out there. We don't. We don't just need to get uh, quantum for quantum's sake, so to speak. Uh, I, I, and, and no disrespect for the uh, th theoretical quantum metaphysics and stuff like that. But if if we talk about using quantum now, it, it needs to solve problems. And that's basically what we're uh, going at. And, and we are using some of uh, IBM's uh, technology. It's interesting you're using it. I was wondering, Daniel, I think, mentioned he just started sort of re-engaging and, and, and coding. Will I correct, Daniel? Um, have you started trying to, to code anything on IBM's free access to quantum computers? Let me just unmute you. Cool. Go, go again, Daniel. We didn't catch any of that. Yeah, I have uh, tried out. Some, some stuff on IBM. I also uh, built my own simulator, which is actually easier than writing the programs themselves. Uh, but it's very hard to make something useful. I think there are a lot of people like me out there who are playing around with those cloud APIs, but don't see the point of making a commercial company at this time. Yeah. David, have you in, in as you was when you were still at Eurostar, were you dabbling on any of the free IBM access? Uh, no, so um, it was honestly just a, a little hobby of mine, you know, just trying to look up the different technologies. So um, it, believe it or not, it just the me finding out even about quantum was just through computer games. Um, so, and then um, it's just sort of my geekiness to sort of go in and uh, find out about them. But uh, no, they're, they're not doing any form of it whatsoever. I mean, the, the most type of exposure that I would have got was simply the fact that we use cloud services and then I see, all right, these cloud services are now providing it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, very, very little exposure whatsoever. Does anybody know of any good resources where you could learn quantum computing? Because we constantly hear that there's this risk of a quantum talent shortage um, where the technology is going to accelerate much faster than people are going to be graduating from quantum engineering. And Daniel, you mentioned that um, seeing on the recruiter side of it, you don't see a lot of people with the skills. So who do you think is sort of best place who's currently in companies to be upskilled to learn quantum and what resources do you think are out there? Uh, at least in Stockholm, there are a lot of people who work in software who actually have an education in physics like me, because 
I mean, there are no jobs, honestly speaking, for physicists, at least not in Stockholm. So mathematicians and physicists go into software IT companies. I work with video streaming. Uh, so those guys, I guess uh, you can lure them back to, to more physics related stuff. And is there an awful lot of extra training that needs to go into that? So that would they need to go back to university or is it something where they are there courses or do you think the capabilities there to sort of train them whilst at doing their jobs in quantum computing? Yes, there is a lot of training. It's, it's extremely hard. So you need to find the people who are really, really interested and who likes a hard challenge and then uh, uh, let them just uh, work, work really hard, spend a lot of time alone thinking about this. Um, Balaji, if you, um, would you like to say something on this? Uh, it's actually, here, keeping at the present uh, scenarios in mind, because uh, hardware is still growing, not not at the full fledged usage that we are using in the quantum computers as of now. But uh, for the resources that what the students could learn or the professionals could adapt to, is there there are different approaches. Like there's an approach for uh, different companies or providing different uh, OS and their coding uh, own stuff and things. So one has to go with the company's interest, like uh, on what they're focusing, like any link systems or lab diode systems or then suppose D-Waves or any other companies, if we take as an example. So it's mainly focusing on the individual uh, company professionals or uh, learning the skills, adopting. But IBM has a most influencing thing that they put their training 5,000 the, by, the, by the coding school and many could learn from there a basic skill of adapting to quantum computing. And yeah, that's, that's, yeah. If I can add one more thing, I think uh, today, when you learn quantum computing, if you pick up a book or IBM's uh, tutorial or whatever, it's very similar to pick up a book on uh, digital uh, trans like transistors, gate technology for computers. And that's not uh, the way you write real software. And what is lacking is a layer to to, see, to create like higher abstractions to work with. Uh, so the industry should focus a lot on building that layer to be able to scale out uh, uh, so more people can work in the field. So I think, and I'm sure IBM is working hard on that. I know also Microsoft with uh, Q Sharp is trying to do that. And it's, um, so we're, our speakers next week are from an organization called um, Cambridge Quantum Computing, which despite the name immediately suggesting that they're yet another company building hardware, they are actually purely focused on you know, de developing the algorithms and the software because their point is that uh, people in businesses who want to make the most of quantum computing driven calculations shouldn't need to worry about what's happening sort of in the black box, so to speak. Um, and so they're, they're doing that, but I think you're right. There's two channels. One is, you know, if you're a bank or if you're a, a, a supermarket chain or a, a, an airline, you either want to have your staff who are able to use a, an abstracted enough language that they can develop in it just like mm -hmm. they would develop in anything else, or you need to turn to a professional service firm to help you. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curiously surprised because I imagine given the noise IBM are making about this, that everyone out there was a sort of closet 
quantum computing coder making the most of, of this. But from what I'm hearing, people are saying that it's just still pretty technically difficult. So you've got to be pretty dedicated if you're sitting there at night trying to, to utilize their solution. If I, if I may add something, uh, I mean, uh, this, this uh, wouldn't be the marketing, but um, one of my friends built or start, uh, run the startup and build the, the quantum programming studio. So I think that tool is, uh, is good for educational purposes because it's free and is, is a platform agnostic. So you can use, you can build a quantum circuit in, uh, let's say in, uh, when you build it, you can run it on any platform like IBM, Penny Lane, I don't know, Rigetti, any, uh, any other. Also, it's like either for, for uh, building uh, quantum circuits or programs. Also, they built uh, a, a quantum algorithm generator, which you, which you feed, uh, you feed that engine with uh, input and possible outputs, and it will generate you the, the, the circuit. And uh, also they have uh, by benchmarks, one of the fastest or the fastest uh, simulator on the world. So uh, now they, they are moving to Finland and also uh, signed some commercial uh, commercial contacts there. So, I mean, they're, they're already very, very successful company. So it's quantum programming studio, but I, uh, what, what, why I mentioned it, because I think it's very, very good to start with and also for, for the educational purposes as a tool. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, and do you think that apart from people who are, I guess, physicists or have, are doing some quantum computing masters or research into it, outside of that space in software engineering, is there a specific programming language that um, is best suited to know or is it a role of a software engineer, a data scientist, who's best suited within a company to sort of, if you were going to upskill your current staff, um, if there was to be a massive um, quantum talent shortage? who would be the person you'd want to sort of um, throw those resources at and teach and could learn the fastest? Maybe FPGA programmers. Sorry. So what, does that, what does that mean, Daniel, at the practical level? So, so which department would those type of people be in? Are they just sort of classical members? It's a hardware department. Okay. Mick, if you think about the insurance world that you know, where um, where would you imagine the first people thinking about this would be appearing? You know, would it be deep in an actuarial function, a data science function, classic IT team? It's tough to say. I mean, it. it Basically, quantum kind of kicks in in areas that are incredibly computationally expensive. So my gut feeling is it would be probably actuarial in the sense of things like maybe capital models. But in a world where capital modeling isn't just used as a regulatory function to kind of tick boxes, but where it's actually used as a way to provide like strategic insights into, you know, the general direction of the company. Because with that amount of, if you can harness that amount of computational power correctly, you can kind of start putting it into tasks where you're dealing with, you know, copulas to deal with the various interactions that are just very, very hard and computationally expensive to do right now. But it means you could start iterating them. Like I've heard most of the story. So for those who aren't familiar with in, um, in insurance, a capital model is kind of like a, a statistical model of the overall company of cash flows. And it takes into account things like you know, how, how profitable are these different lines of business, but also how correlated are they? So if one goes bad, is another likely to go bad? But also linking in things like, you know, if you have reinsurance to help you protect in the case of things go bad, what's the likelihood of your reinsurance partners? Uh, you know, are they still going to be solvent because the rest of the world is blown up? And do you have a, you know, a credit risk problem with them? And it tries to capture all of them. The problem with it right now is those tend to be very old, like, clunky and inflexible and they're not really allowed change much because the regulators doesn't don't like it um so that you know they can take days to run in some case you can if you can really compress that timeline down to make it you know to run all these models with scenario analysis in 10 or 15 minutes to me that is a very big game changer 
So it strikes me as something that would be actuarial um, to the outside world, although in a lot of cases, these things are very highly regulated and strict. So I guess it would probably be a combination of actuarial and data science and that kind of technological thing, but with definitely a lot of regulatory input. That's my gut feeling in terms of insurance, but I don't really have a good sense for that. I think it depends on how these things become usable to the common person or the common coder, as opposed to just being something that kind of hobbyists use. Sorry, I appreciate it, Paolo, that's a very long-winded answer. No, no, but I think the, the reason it's a long-winded answer is because it's not a straightforward answer. I'm sure if we're sitting here in two or three years' time, these questions will seem you know, almost pathetically simple. Yeah. But right now, the fact that we're all struggling to answer them is, I think, indicative of you know, why it's so exciting, which is, frankly, we're pretty much clueless as to, to how this is developing, but we know the opportunity is fantastically yeah. big. But like my gut feeling is capital modeling in general in insurance is something that is kind of a missed opportunity because like I said, it's taken on this very kind of regimented regulatory role. But if you can do that properly, it becomes a very, very useful kind of board level strategic tool for the overall direction of the company. But that would require probably an order of magnitude increase in computational power and possibly more than that, you know, to do it properly in a way that actually makes sense and is uh, understandable to people. Thank you for that. Um, I think that leads quite nicely to um, our next question, which is Andy shared that IBM's vision of a roadmap to a thousand qubits, um, which could obviously solve a lot more computationally heavy problems. Um, it's sort of estimated that we need around 150 qubits for meaningful applications in the sort of biopharma industries. I uh, wanted to know if anyone had any ideas how many sort of qubits the financial industry would need to be looking at for those meaningful applications. So how many sort of qubits do we need until we think, okay, we can do stuff like capital modeling now? Can, can I jump in on that? Uh, I think it, it's very useful if you separate the hardware from the, uh, as, as our Swiss friend said, from the from the software or the OS. Um, I think IBM together with the MIT came out a couple of months ago saying what they've been working on with, uh, with Watson, if that's going to have any meaningful uh, power increase, it's going to be maybe 50 years before they get a, a, another one or two uh, factors of, of, uh, of power build into what, what they're dealing with right now. So we're, we're definitely, and, and since we don't have the metal right now, and which is what IBM is, is traditionally, having been where they're traditionally uh, uh, getting into, I, I think we need to start looking at a hybrid model where we enhance analog computing to mimic uh, through simulation some of the things that we can do with uh, with quantum computing on an, on an OS layer and making it more useful. And that, that's what we're doing at, at Teridian right now and being quite successful at it, uh, solving the uh, 10,000 piece puzzle and stuff like that in, in less than 20 minutes, for instance. Uh, but there's, there's also some other things. So I would say from your previous question, Sorry to be long-winded there, but these these are kind of things that you can't separate. The the data analysts are the ones that are that are going to be able to adapt into this more readily than anybody else. If if you look at um, if you look at wanting to implement hardware, I mean, you have to go back to university and start over again because nothing from an analog computer or well, very little from an analog computer can actually be extrapolated over onto what quantum is supposed to be doing or, or, or claim to be able to be doing in, 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 in solving problems. And 100 qubits, uh, it, it depends on who you talk to. 100 qubits is not going to do anything. Uh, people are now talking about several thousand qubits. Now we're, now we're talking 10 to 15 years before we even have, and, and depending on what technology you, you, you're working on. I mean, there are, there are some, some good breakthroughs in, in ambient temperature 
gateways and stuff like that 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 looks promising but uh, we still don't have the 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 score is not in on 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 most of that stuff yet because it, it's so new but I, I think we need to get to a hybrid model where we actually start applying some of the quantum physics to the analog system and, and, and build it out so we can actually start playing around with what the outcomes are. I mean, we're, we're playing with uh, 128 uh, uh, data feeds right now and, and getting uh, less than 0 0.01 second uh, resp response time, even from Arizona, where we're sitting in, in Europe, I'm sitting in Stuttgart and Scott is sitting in, in England. So once we're getting down into those things where you can actually get an instant result monitoring 128 channels of three years worth of data with Bitcoin prices, for instance, I'm just mentioning that because that's what we're doing right now. And, and we can actually start predicting at 85% certainty uh, what the the price will be tomorrow based on what we know from, from history. Uh, getting it, I'm, I'm not in insurance. I used to work in insurance, but I think insurers on the, uh, in general could, could actually use that uh, quite significantly very early on, maybe, maybe even within the next six months if they, if they start adapting the hybrid, which is what I'm uh, greatly interested in. Sorry. A little bit long-winded, but it's a three-part. No, again, um, I think <laughs> there's a need for that long-winded answer. Um, Balaji, did you want to um, make a comment? Yes, uh, uh, what Berlin was saying is absolutely right. And uh, because uh, as you asked about the use case that uh, how much does we require to do the optimization techniques for the financial modeling or something, but uh, if we take into other use cases as well, uh, there need to be growth in the other fields as well. That we, we do have the computing power, but it's being developed more and more. And as you said, hybrid systems need to be evolved in, will be evolved in the next few years. But uh, there should be also developments in the other fields of uh, data or uh, hardware uh, fields like sensor networks or anything parallelly with the computing development so that applications could grow in the next few years. I think what's really interesting um, hearing these responses as well as someone who is a complete sort of um, a novice to this field is that when we talk about qubits, I know there's a difference between logical qubits, physical qubits, and as you um, mentioned, you know, sometimes uh, you have to separate sort of the hardware from the software. And I guess there's this sort of, the field is quite unstandardized at the moment because of so many different technologies and so many different, um, you know, qubit technologies out there that when we, when you want to communicate this to someone who isn't within the field, um, it can be quite confusing and when you want to sort of talk about roadmaps, there isn't that clear indication of when, because we might be speaking completely different languages when we say the same word, for example, qubits. We could be referring to, I guess, different things. You can use maybe the expression useful qubit. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need 1,000 qubits to create one useful qubit that will not uh, be in a state of error all the time. And so, uh, sorry, go on. And there is also another thing that the qubits are uh, need to uh, reach what is called an entangled state. Uh, sometimes to use uh, their maximum potential, but the way they're organized, <coughs> it might not be that all 150 qubits you have in this example can entangle with each other. Maybe they are. Uh, you can only have 10 entangled, and but then they have like 15 sets of 10 in the computer. So you need to dig down one level below uh, and not only read the headlines when you see uh, news about quantum computers. No, yes, definitely. I think there can be a lot of um, inflation about what 
what is expected from quantum computers, especially because we sometimes hear, you know, we're going to have applications within the next two years, sometimes it's in the next 15 years, and there is that digging down that definitely needs to be done. Paolo, you're on mute. Uh, you'd think after nine months I'd have worked that out. Um, so it'll be interesting hearing from the Cambridge Quantum Computing crew next week, because obviously, you know, they're, they're a, essentially a, an engineering and sales organization, right? They've clearly got to have some kind of product and capability, but they also want to be out there persuading you know, financial firms, automotive firms, pharmaceutical firms, etc., that they want to start using their services. So I think it's going to be, to be very interesting hearing how they are explaining that even with the level of qubits we have available to us at the moment, companies should, should be investing. So I, I look forward to that discussion because I think everything that's been said over the last few minutes is, is exactly right. That, you know, frankly, we haven't really got anywhere and it's not like we're six or 12 months away. We are still, you know, we're, we're comfortable that the technology works. That's a big difference to 10 years ago when I think there were still question marks, but we're not actually at a place where we can do much of any use. I think one uh, thing that can become successful before others is Monte Carlo simulation. You're familiar with that? Because it has, it's inherently random and probabilistic. Uh, so you don't have to rely on a, you don't need fully reliable qubits. So long as you get, uh, you are right enough in the answer, uh, you're good to go. So if you have a Monte Carlo model problem and you just need to make a forecast or something that points in the right direction. Yeah, one, one issue you would have there though is that usually with Monte Carlo simulation, you require reproducibility like with seeding. So you'd need to make the quantum fluctuations there might break that. So that yeah. could be an, that, that's just something I've thought of there because the, the stuff I was talking about with capital modeling would all be Monte Carlo simulation based. But now that yeah, I think about so it, you need an algorithm. It. Yeah, because it all uses pseudo random number generation, which, which you can seed so that you can fully reproduce everything. Yeah. So you need to have an algorithm that makes that produces a result that is some kind of average over a large number of uh, uh, sample paths or something like that. So it will the average will not fluctuate based on the random input. And then the other thing is also like why why bother, right? Like, why wouldn't you just use normal algorithms as opposed to quantum ones? Why, why go through the complexity if you don't have a meaningful gain on any sort of metrics? Right. Because at least- that, That's the, the billion dollar question that I think working out which of the simulations would benefit yeah. versus which are the ones that won't. Yeah, like pharma is, is like a perfect problem for what quantum is really good at because you're simulating atoms, right? The only analogy that I see that's in insurance would be maybe like weather simulations or something like that, where you say, okay, like it's just the perfect problem so that even if you have a small number of qubits, you can still gain in quality of the output that you're measuring. I think whether you need to probe and measure the state in the real world. So maybe you need to have like weather stations everywhere. You can build it into smartphones maybe. Well, one, one very interesting uh, thing that's coming on now is the integration of quantum uh, simulation with uh, machine learning. And, and one example is, is the fully self-driving car, let's just say Tesla, because everybody's talking about that. Now, one of the things on the edge computing thing is you need, you need the kind of speed that we humans have in identifying what problems there are when you're traveling along in your self-driving car, not having, well, potentially not having any say-so in what it does and, and what it doesn't do. 
So what what we found, <clears throat> what we're working on in in the individual field with quantum simulation right now is basically. It, it, it's more about the out layers. So if we can find a methodology or an algorithm that looks out for the abnormalities in what the car's cameras are seeing, this is what Tesla is doing or trying to do, have, have been somewhat successful, but they're still using analog, even though they're using their own chip, which is greatly uh, quicker than what was out there by quip manufacture, the chip manufacturers before. But when, when we start looking at something like that and, and we start blend, blending into the in, into the hybrid world, we can then start taking advantage of. So if, if I drove in my car today and it, it saw something that was unusual, it, it, it flags it, either it sends it to me to for me to identify, hey, uh, pair, I didn't understand what I just saw. Can you help me with this? Or it sends it back to Tesla, which it does right now. And, and they look at it and say, I don't know if anybody remembers having heard about this Tesla that kept stopping outside a uh, Burger King, and then they found out that they thought there was a, there was some kind of problem with with the camera, and it it thought it was a, a Burger King sign was a stop sign in California, so it stopped. Yeah, because it it was it was programmed to do that. So once once we find out all these out layers, and this is part part of of of, and I I deliberately don't call it. Uh, AI, I call it machine learning because AI is not here in any any meaningful way yet. That's 15, 20 years down down the road. But machine learning, which is what the uh, self-driving cars are doing, is basically flagging all these out layers that they don't understand, sending it back to control, getting a, 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 a human. Right now, it's a human interaction, but they're trying to machine learn. Okay, yeah, we've seen that before. That, that was the same as over here. And the more the, the more you do of that, the more clearly the map of the world will become kind of what Google did 20 years ago with driving around with a camera on top of, but but for me to visually inspect where I'm I'm driving and stuff, not necessarily for the for the car to know, but that was a, a precursor of that. So once once we start getting into some of these things, we've made some some very interesting uh, proof of concepts in in Hong Kong where we identify who are what what type of person is actually looking at uh, uh, screens in the underground just to see are, are people actually looking at my advert when it's on and and counting eyeballs and and then making a probabilistic determination of of what age group uh, denomination of the person uh, what what whatever the uh, advertisers are are interested in. But it, it again, I'm, I'm, I keep coming back to this. It, it, for now, it has to be a hybrid solution because we don't have anything else. We don't have the 1500 qubit, which is segmented into, uh, and, and actually with a 1500 uh, uh, qubit piece of metal, you, you would probably use 25% of the qubits to control the rest of the qubits to measure on them. Are you actually in, a, in an entangled state or are you doing, are, are you actually, are you, are you within, the functionality that we have spec that you should be. So you're losing up to 25% of the qubits. Uh, so there is a little bit of inflation going on, a little bit of hype in, in the industry saying that we have some other people coming out saying, oh, we're working on a, on a I can't remember, it was a 3,500 qubit thing. Yeah, but it, it's it, exponentially as you increase the amount of qubits, you, you need to have more qubits to control the qubits that are actually working. So you have this kind of, uh, I call it mushrooming in, 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 in the qubit world, in, in the metal world, uh, where you actually have physical uh, machine parts that you will be growing the observers in the qubits exponentially the same as you grow the qubits that, that, are, that are working. So I don't know, uh, some people are looking into how they can do that with different gates and stuff like that. There's a company in Denmark that's doing some wonderful stuff. But again, it, it's, it's, it's only in simulation right now. So <clears throat> until we see it in, in, the, in, the, in the wild, as I call it, uh, we, yeah. we, won't really, we won't really know what, uh, what's up or down. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
I'm just aware of time and like to um, ask Jeremy to also um, talk to us, please, about his um, quirky ideas. <laughs> ah, you've got two topics, haven't you, Jeremy? Over to you to inspire us. Yes, awesome. So um, I'm usually in, uh, in Southern California, but at the moment I'm in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Indiana. Um, a, uh, in terms of the, uh, the technology side, I am the co-founder of Quantum Star Systems. What we're building is a, a software development hub and software development like environment and engine uh, that really addresses a lot of the things that you guys were mentioning. Um, in terms of uh, offering a universal language and a uh, yeah a way for developers that really don't need a physics degree to be able to program for quantum computing and create software for quantum computers and then uh, our back end we have um, uh, compilers and things that allow it to go into uh, to run on quantum computers. And so what we're doing is uh, providing a service to, uh, to organizations to kind of help that transition along. So basically we're gonna take their current data infrastructure and pr provide all the upgrades and then allow them access to our cloud quantum computing uh, services. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's where we're at with that, like we're, uh, like our CTO has already uh, created the formulas and um, we've tested it on IBM's quantum computer. And uh, we also are also doing our own quantum computing simulator. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's quantum star systems. Um, and I, I feel like if we uh, can go at the accelerated pace that we want to go. Like we're working on getting some more funding and all of that. We can have our uh, our hub, at least the MVP built within a year, uh, which will allow people, uh, us to build the libraries and basically tantamount to what Apple did with with their SDK, which opened up the mobile mobile app industry. We want to do that for the quantum, quantum computing industry. Um, so that's, that's one side and then as, the, the quirky factor, <laughs> uh, which I love. Um, uh, on the other side of my, my work is I, I am applying quantum mechanics in the, in the healing and personal development space. Uh, and I'm calling it imagination technology. And uh, if anyone's interested, please reach out to me. I've got a manual, I've got all, all sorts of fun stuff that you can read uh, to really like dive into uh, how I'm applying and, and teach uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics uh, in terms of upgrading the human brain is how I look at it uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the flow of passion. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Fantastic, Jeremy, a question on each of those. So in quantum star systems, sort of get your aspiration, you know, once your MVP is up and running and you're, you're starting to turn to commercial organizations, which industries do you see are likely to take it up first? Uh, it, it's great because I'm listening to this and I'm gathering all, all of the good data and, and knowledge from you guys. Um, at the moment, uh, we have been in talks with Bayer, so the pharmaceuticals like you guys were mentioning. Um, one of the uh, clients that is furthest in deal flow right now in terms of, of really showing interest is uh, in energy, uh, in the energy space. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, uh, the, uh, the companies that are utilizing big data and they want high performance real time. So they've got a lot of analytics and they uh, around safety for the energy companies and things like that. Uh, so they need to be able to, to process a lot faster and, and not have any bottlenecks. Um, and then also uh, the finance is, is another area we want to look into. Um, yeah, but that's, that, that's the current ones. Of course, uh, a lot of industry potentials, um, but at the moment, those are the most real. 
Excellent. Thank you. And in the in the second part, the imagination technology, what, what yeah. was the trigger of that? Um, that, you know, is it by chance that it's you're, you're doing two very different quantum ventures or, or is it related? Uh, to me, it's the same mountaintop. The human and the, the machine are the same mountaintop to me uh, and the same evolution. Uh, we're we're each helping each other uh, evolve. Um, and uh, the way that I, I think I can most express it tangibly would be I, Albert Einstein's work really took mathematics and physics uh, to the edge of, of discovery and paradigm shift uh, in terms of the theory of, of relativity. Um, I kind of take his work and I'm standing on his shoulders and taking it into the imagination and taking it into quantum physics uh, which to me is uh, is allowing, in terms of the clients that I work with and myself, opening up access to more possibilities in our brain uh, and higher frequencies, allowing higher frequencies of data to process through us because everything is frequencies, everything is energy. And the same way that a, a data infrastructure gets bottlenecked by uh, large amounts of data going through small pipelines. That's the same thing that happens to people that are struggling with stress or anxiety or any of those kind of mental, emotional, physical ailments. It's energy getting stuck. And so if you can upgrade the processing power of the brain to go to higher frequencies, uh, more and more human potential gets unlocked. Uh, and that's, that's what, what I look at as imagination technology as an evolution from information technology, getting away from the ones and zeros of information and being an information consumption species to quantum and being that, being that particle, being that photon. Uh, and uh, and it's, it, to me, it's a parallel. The same way that we're manipulating a photon with quantum computing, we're manipulating light in our brain uh, in order to access more possibilities and our imagination. Fantastic, thank you. Now, I, I'm always keen that we, we finish by the hour because that's our, our commitment to people. Are there any quick questions from people to Jeremy? I've seen a few requests in the chat, Jeremy, for links to your material. So, um, yes, I, have it. I will post it right now. Um, Balaji, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Jeremy. Hello. Um, it's, it's driving me crazy, <laughs> all the ideas which you have and yeah. uh, that, um, but mostly concerned, I, I'm based in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I was mostly interested in the part that you were talking about the big data and the stuff that using your quantum systems that process the data at a higher complexity and computational levels. And what kind of data structures and uh, like, how are you going to implement that? I missed that. How, how can you? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Um, uh, regarding the big data level in processing the pipelines for data and uh, getting for to process high amounts of data using quantum computing. Yes. Um, so it, uh, I can give you as as technical because I'm really the <laughs> he, he's the CTO. Um, it's, oh, okay. Jeremy, let, let yeah. me jump in a second. If, if I can wrap up briefly, because I know a few people want to drop off, and then those, those who we can either stay on or, or something, and maybe while I'm wrapping up, you just want to put the, the links into the chat for people, or I'll send them out afterwards. Um, thank you, everyone who joined. As I say, aware that we try and stick to the hour, so understand that, that many of you will need to drop off now. Um, if, you, um, if there's anything you want in the write-up uh, in terms of your company name, your company connection, please do share that. If you want to hear from Cambridge Quantum Computing, that's next week and available um, free webinar tickets. And we'll be doing a similar Stamtish discussion to this uh, in mid-December, so we look forward. But um, yeah, I'm gonna keep the, the communication open now for, for Jeremy to answer Balaji's question and any other questions there are. So thank you to those who need to leave and please continue, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm posting the link to the Imagination Technology Manual and my website right now. 
And then please connect with me on LinkedIn as well. We can start a conversation there. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, um, uh, what, what we're doing is basically we're creating that hub so that all of these data sets um, can be integrated as, as, uh, as integrations with the hub. And then the, the way that we process and, and send that into a compiler for it to be a quantum computing, uh, for it to run on the quantum computer, that, that's kind of what the, the CTO has invented with this, if that makes sense. I, if I understand the question that you're asking, Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can discuss. I'll connect with you on LinkedIn, yeah? And we can- Please, yeah, please, please, yeah. please do. I would love to have a conversation. Yeah. Perfect. And any final questions for Jeremy? He's, he's shared his details here. Um, else, I will wrap things up. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for your thoughts, your discussions. As I say, it'll be intriguing to, to look back in a couple of years time and realize how confused and ignorant we were. Um, but I look forward to, to spending time with many of you over the, the coming months as we get ever more clear on this topic. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This, thank you everyone for organizing. This is a really informative session, yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, bye. Perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, speak to you soon. I was saying thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paulo. I didn't know I was needed. <laughs> no, that's cool. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Um, good. Thanks, Anna. I'm going to, um, to to leave now. I presume the recording will stop on its own. And um, I'll speak to you tomorrow. I've got to go to, to dinner. I'm late for dinner. <laughs> sure. See you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.